You're listening to the My Simplified Life podcast, and this is episode number 44. Welcome to the My Simplified Life podcast, a place where you will learn that your past and even your present don't define your future. Regardless of what stage of life you're in, I want you to feel inspired and encouraged to pursue your dreams, simplify your life, and start taking action today. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac, and I'm excited to share my stories and life lessons with you while taking you on my own journey. This is my simplified life. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac, and boy, oh boy, am I giddy to introduce you to my guest today. Madison Anaya is the host of the Fearless Chase podcast and a content strategist who discovered early on the importance of chasing after your dreams. She's pivoted in her own life and is one of the sweetest, full-of-life women I know. She's a ball of fire, and she has incredible strategies and tools when it comes to recognizing what you should be saying in your content in order to speak directly to your ideal client. Madison's mantra is to just be yourself. And friends, let me tell you, she is exactly who she was made to be. And I am so over the moon happy about that. Madison has also built a community of female entrepreneurs who are some of the most supportive and encouraging women out there. I joke that I'm almost old enough to be her mom, but let me tell you the truth. This woman is going places and building big things. We're talking about content strategy as well as imposter syndrome, and Madison gets really candid with us on her own experiences with imposter syndrome. You won't need coffee for this episode because Madison is bringing all the energy you need. Hey, Madison. Hey, Michelle. I am so excited to chat with you. It's been so long since we've chatted, like literally talked, but I see you every day, so it doesn't seem like you're far. (laughs) Oh, I know. Same. Isn't it so cool just how social media just makes that available to us? It is. It's a blessing and a curse because you think that, you know, (laughs) oh, I just I just saw Madison yesterday. It's like, no, we really haven't talked for probably months. Oh, yeah. Uh, (laughs) And you can get into some real trouble when it's like, yeah, you get into some real trouble there when it's like your mom, though, because you're like, oh, I totally have talked to her like in the last week. And you look back and you're like, man, it's been a few weeks. I've just seen her Facebook posts. (laughs) (laughs) For me, it's been even longer, but that's a whole other episode and topic. (laughs) to go into. Uh, Can you please introduce yourself to everyone since we're just going to take over and and chat and nobody's going to know who you are? (laughs) Yeah, totally. So um, I'm the host of the Fearless Chase community where I kind of bind together business education and community for female creative entrepreneurs to find friends and just kind of reach their goals together through podcasts and conferences and all kinds of fun stuff on social media. And how did you get into this? G- give me your your backstory as to your journey to do what you're doing today. Yeah, that's a great question because um, I think it it doesn't really match what people would normally guess it would be. So I was on the path to like living this suburban dream, and going to college and getting married to my middle school sweetheart and setting out for this career in communications. And between just kind of like personal and family crisis, I quickly realized that that's not what I wanted. And I wanted to figure out who I was created to be and kind of pursue that. And so um, just to kind of give you a little backstory on what that looked like. I got married at 21. A few months after that, I ended up totaling my car, which is not a big deal unless you're 21 and you barely have that deductible in savings because you just bought a house and did did the wedding and all of that. Um, and then a few months after that, we unfortunately were sitting around a table and, and planning the funeral for my father-in-law who lost his battle to stage four colon cancer. And then a few months after that, my house flooded in Hurricane Harvey. And then a few months after that, my mother-in-law got cancer. And a few months after that, my parents got divorced. And it was like one thing after another, after another. And I needed something to have as like my own little outlet because I felt like I was drowning. Um, Because this was all within about a year and a half span. And I was at the same time still trying to go to school and get these degrees and try to figure out who I wanted to be in life and, and all these different things. And so I was working at a corporate 
corporate job doing all kinds of stuff as a small business. So it's one of those businesses where you may have a title, but it doesn't really matter because everyone does everything kind of thing. And I was running conferences and events and social media and building websites and all of that. And I got really interested in just learning more about that world. I had started a blog that kind of fell off. It was about being a newlywed because apparently as soon as you get married, you're an expert on being a newlywed and you should share that information with people. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, through everything that was happening, it kind of just fell to the wayside. And I had come across some people who were really encouraging and spreading a lot of messages of hope through their social media. And I ended up getting a free ticket to a women's conference, a personal growth women's conference. And I remember sitting there in that arena and thinking, or it was a theater actually, but sitting there thinking, you know, I just really wish somebody would come up to me and ask me like, why are you still in school? And you, you know, you play the whole scene in your head of like, this is going to be the turning moment. I'm clearly not dramatic at all. Um, and I haven't seen too many <laughs> movies, but in my head, I was like, if someone asked me like, why are you still in school? Like I would say, well, cause I already paid for it. And I already put some time into this. So I should probably get the paper at the end. And they would say, well, that's not a good enough reason. You should go after your dreams and yada, yada. Well, Long story short, that never happened. Nobody asked me that. And so <laughs> I just But you were kinda, asking yourself, obviously. I was asking myself. <laughs> and so I walked away from that and I said, okay, I think I'm going to give myself a semester off and really go after whatever it is I think I want to try. And if it completely flops, then I will just go back. Like I never you know, de-enrolled myself or anything like that. And so I came back from that conference. I started a podcast called The Fearless Chase. And it was ultimately to see how other people had fearlessly chased after their own dreams to see like kind of how... um, I don't know if you've ever listened to that podcast, How I Built This but just kind of like learning how other people had done it. So like, is there a common thread? Am I cut out for this? Like, what? how is everyone figuring this out? And through that, I interviewed this amazing gal named Michaela Quinn, and she was teaching people how to be a VA. And at the time, I didn't even know what a VA was. I thought that was uh, stood for like veteran. I did not know that that <laughs> was a job and or a career or anything like that. And so after that conversation, I was like, heck yeah, I want to work from home. Heck yeah, I want to, you know, do my own thing and and whatever. And so I started taking clients on the side and eventually that built out to a full roster. And I was able to transition from this corporate job that I had into doing virtual assistants full time. Um, And through that, I realized where my strong points were, which was not offering anything and everything, which is what I obviously did in the beginning. (laughs) As do most Uh, people make that mistake in the beginning. They're like, I'll do anything. You need me to build a website? You want me to podcast pitch you? You need me to make graphics? I'll do it all. You want me to come to your town and video you? Sure, I can do it all. Uh, But I quickly realized that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yes, we all are because we're like, we're so scared that we're going to lose clients and have to go back to that corporate job. That's so scary. And um, and then have everyone see you fail and have to come back and say, well, it didn't work. So anyways, I I kind of realized where my sweet spot was and where people were really asking for so much help around was content strategy, what to say on their social media, what to say on their Instagram stories, who they're talking to, how to figure all that out. Because a lot of these people had even built up followings, but then they were like, I jump on and I don't know what to say, or I don't know how to sell, or I I get nervous about this or that and the other. And so um, I pivoted and I, you know, really honed in on that skill. I then started to pursue throwing events, which we did this past fall was our first in-person event. And it was a dream come true. It was so exciting. Um, and then obviously we were planning our, our second one and then COVID hit. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And, and that journey, because, you know, I don't think a lot of people think that that's where it started is a newlywed blog <laughs> because no one has ever heard of that. <laughs> but that's just my own personal journey. And I think it's really cool to hear where other people have started because a lot of times it's nowhere near where they're at now. I think most times it's nowhere near where they're at. I, you know, my story, I've been on your podcast and yeah, it, it just totally takes a flip. And you said something about um, how we do all of the things because we don't want to fail to go back to the job. But I think that there's also a part where we do all the things because we don't know yet what that one thing is that we're so good at. Oh, so true. So true. Especially if you're like, kind of like me where you're multi-passionate and you're kind of this jack of all trades and you can pretty much figure anything out. It's kind of hard to know which one thing you really want to 
narrow down to. And so I can remember, um, and I, I feel so much compassion for my clients now when I'm like, let's niche down. That was like the worst thing you could have told me in the beginning. Cause I was like, I want to do everything and I want to serve everyone. And <laughs> that was definitely a swim upstream for me to try to, to try to figure that out. I, I'm in the same exact boat because it's, it's literally what I've been doing recently. And it's what I do with my clients as well as like, you no, know, you have to niche down more. And I know I have to do it too. And it's hard. It's letting go of these things that you know, and sometimes they're, they're the sure thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is hard. And it's intimidating because in our heads, we think that if we niche down, then there's not going to be enough people to serve or enough people to have as clients or, or customers or anything like that. But it's actually the opposite is true. I definitely agree. I think when you, you have a specialty, then it makes you stand out even more. Mm-hmm. And along those lines, let's talk because this is something you talk about a lot, imposter syndrome and how that comes into play. I know that for me, there's a, there's not a number of, but there's quite a few people who do what I do and it's becoming more and more kind of quote unquote popular. And I've seen myself looking at them like, oh, what are they doing? How are they doing it differently? And it doesn't benefit me at all. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) how, how do you, how do you work with your clients when it comes to something like that? Because I'm sure it's something that comes up. Maybe they don't know that this is going on in their heads, that they're looking at their competitors' content or or larger people? Talk to me about that. This is a great question because this is something that I think every single person struggles with, whether you're in entrepreneurship or not, whether you're, you know, a new mom, you're looking around and you're thinking, you know, what if they figure out I don't know what I'm doing? That's the biggest fear, right? What if they figure out that I that they don't that I don't know what I'm doing? And I think for me, my own journey through it was I was incredibly insecure with how much younger I was than a lot of the peers that I was starting to become friends with in the space that I was in. You know, I think I was about 22, 23 whenever I was starting this. I threw my first event at 24. And I remembered being so nervous about doing that because I thought no one's going to want to listen to this 24 year old. They're going to say she doesn't have experience or she doesn't have enough life or all of this. And I don't know why that was my biggest insecurity, but for the longest time it was. And then it just hit me one day, this reminder of growing up in church. I was a part of a youth group that was called LIT which they thought it was a good idea to put on t-shirts, I am lit, um, which was very (laughs) confusing when this little Jesus loving church girl was walking around high school and all of a sudden like a different crowd was giving you looks like, oh, (laughs) I didn't realize you were in on that. And I was like, well, no, uh, I'm very confused right now. Maybe you should look at the back of the shirt with the scripture. Like I was... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Just so confused. But what it stood for was leaders in training. And I think for the longest time, you know, growing up middle school, high school, the big thing that was like so feared to be called was a poser, right? It was like in middle school, I wanted to try all the different looks. I one day would wear a bow and super preppy. And then the next day I wore way too much eyeliner and a spiked belt and like blue mascara. Like it. <laughs> It was rough times. Everyone now has really cute pictures. And I was like, okay, well, that wasn't fair for me uh, because I went through (laughs) very awkward stages. And But I can remember anytime I wanted to try something new, it was immediately you were called a poser or a fake or a wannabe. And it was so frowned upon to try to step out of the box that people were putting you in and or the one that you kind of owned first, that people knew you as first. And when I stepped into this youth group, it was leaders in training. And so they would put us in positions where we could try anything and everything, right? So I actually met my husband at that youth group. That's why he asked me to be his girlfriend when we were 14. And um, I remember he wanted to try the drums and he was awful at first. And they just encouraged him and just keep trying, keep trying. I was like, at one point I got to be the leader of the band and I got to sing and I got to speak on stage and I got to teach children's church. I got to try all these different things. And while looking back, I'm sure it was so incredibly cringy to watch me try these things because I was awful at them. They just kept encouraging me and they saw what I could 
do and they saw any ounce of potential that I showed, they said, hey, you should try this. And when I felt like I was failing at it or I was terrible at it, they would just remind me, you're in training. And so for the people that I work with now, I just remind them, you're in training no matter what position you're in, whether you're a CEO or an intern, if you want to grow you have to allow yourself to be a beginner and you have to allow yourself to be in training. And that perspective change for me has almost completely rid imposter syndrome of my life because anytime I'm worried that people are going to think that I don't know what I'm doing, I just straight up say it. Guys, I have no clue what I'm doing. We're taking this day by day and that's okay. And I feel like the more that you are transparent about not having all the answers about everything, then the more people trust you because the more you can humanize things, the more that no like and trust factor is there. And I think as far as comparison goes, that is something that I still struggle with, but I feel like that's a little bit of a different vein than just imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome says like, oh, I'm worried that they're not gonna think I'm good enough or whatever. Whereas comparison is I'm not as good as somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if that's very helpful, but I think for me, that's been the biggest shift for me and for my clients for sure. You know what I find funny is that you said that you were worried about your age and being too young. Well, I'm like the, one of the oldest people (laughs) to be starting out. (laughs) I'll be 39 next week. So like I watch you and others who are, you know, in their late twenties and their early thirties. And I'm like, oh, I wish I would have started this like a decade ago because Mm. my goodness, how much further I would be. And, you know, it's kind of the opposite where you say, oh, there's not this life experience. Yes, I've got the life experience, but then there's all of these new things like podcasts. I didn't Mm. know how to listen to one two years ago. So you know, There's honestly, a learning same curve. though, same. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> but I love that, that and, and I totally agree that you need to humanize and just be candid with everyone. I try very hard in my content, whether it's Instagram or the podcast, to just be real and this is what's going on, you know, and it's not all roses and butterflies and you don't just wake up one morning and go, oh, I'm going to start a podcast and start a business and oh, look, I'm successful. Like there's a lot of work that goes into it. And, you know, I think that one of the greatest things is the friendships that you make, because Mm. I'm just thinking back to you and I and how we've connected. And I treasure that. I think that's one of the best things that comes out of all of this in the online business um, space is that we get to connect with people like you. Yeah. I just love that. (laughs) I love it too. And I think that for me, one of my biggest struggles throughout my journey has been feeling so alone. So I'm very extroverted. And I went from having an office full of friends to working by myself, as a lot of us do. And you quickly realize how lonely it is because a lot of us are not surrounded immediately by other people going after what we're going after. And so I can remember even now, my closest friends, my family they probably cannot tell you what I do, right? Like, they're just like, we're here for it. Yay, Madison. But they (laughs) they couldn't tell you what I do. They're just like, yeah, she's she's kind of on the radio, I think, but you can't find her in your car (laughs) and unless you use your phone and, and all these different things. But I think, you know, the community element, when you start to be intentional about it and you start to seek it out, it's really a beautiful thing. And I that was a big driving force for me to create the whole Fearless Chase community element of what I do because I wanted to provide a space where people felt 100% loved and accepted and cheered on and a safe space for people to be able to ask questions without being nervous of coming off like they don't, again, the imposter syndrome. And just to kind of go back to that, just one more thing on, on imposter syndrome in comparison, I've noticed when we can focus more on serving instead of impressing whether it's for our clients or people we want to work with, or even other people that we want to build community with, if you can focus more on serving, everything else kind of falls to the wayside. And so I remember when I did my first speaking engagement, it was for a room of almost 200 women business owners in Dallas. And I don't know if you've ever been to Dallas, but basically like everyone in Dallas is just bred to be beautiful. They just are. They're just gorgeous humans. They're (laughs) they're just- Have you seen Real Housewives? Yeah, basically (laughs) that, right? So if you can just picture picture a room full of that. I've spent time in Dallas and it's it's the truth. Like these people- it is. But they are, it is real. That is yeah. how they look. And there is big hair. And I lived in Houston for a while too. And But Dallas but Houston is... Houston is different. Yeah. yeah. I'm from Houston. But and so Dallas is, is a big different There is big hair breed. and makeup and 
jewels and like the bigger, the better. Yeah. And I'm, I'm currently recording this wearing like an oversized t-shirt and track shorts and no makeup. So like, that's my everyday look. It's just kind of like, Hey, we're all just hanging out. Um, and so I remember when I, right before I went up to speak at that conference, I was so intimidated and I don't even know why, because that group was so incredible once I finally got to talk to them, but I had built up in my head that they're going to think you're not enough. They're going to know right away. You don't fit in here, like all these things. And so I wrote, with a pin on my arm, serve. And at the end of it, they were so engaged throughout my top, throughout my talk. And I was like, oh my gosh, these girls are so great. I'm just going to tell them what this is. And so I was like, all right, I don't know if any of y'all have seen this, but this is not a crappy tattoo. I actually just wrote this before I walked up because I was nervous about needing to impress you. And then as soon as I realized that it wasn't about impressing you, it was about serving you with what I have right now. That's when the magic kind of happens. I I'm so in love with that statement to to serve. You give me like goosebumps. That <laughs> I love that. That is the best. I I sit here during a lot of the interviews. I'll sit here and I'm like, oh, that's a good quote. Oh, that's and I'm thinking ahead of like <laughs> what I want people to get from it. And if anybody listening gets one thing, that was it. Yeah. To create your content and do what you do to serve others. Yeah. I love it, Madison. You you are so wise beyond your years. You have no idea. Oh, thank you. I like to think I'm probably like 82 on the inside. I mean, I, I <laughs> was getting gray hair when I was 14. I still try to cover up with highlights because I'm like, maybe they'll think it's platinum pieces and it was intentional. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I just, I got started getting some grays after my second was born. And now that we've been in COVID, I'm like, oh my goodness they're really starting to come in. <laughs> yeah. Well, good for you that you, you know, had so many years without it because I, <laughs> I was at the hair salon. Every time I go to a hair salon and a new person, they're like, oh my gosh, you have so many grays. Do you know you have so many grays? I'm like, why do you think I'm here? Like I, we both can see that. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing it out. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait until you have kids because mine like to point it out to my husband. (laughs) Your hair is not black. It's like white. (laughs) Yeah. He appreciates that more than you know. Yep. (laughs) Uh, Let's switch gears and go back to what you're doing with your clients in creating content for them. Mm -hmm. Because I'm curious about this because as I'm growing and I'm thinking about what is it in my business that I want to outsource or I can hand off I think a lot about content because I create a boatload, you know, between the podcasts and you're doing Instagram. I I try to post four times a week and then you've got stories and everything else and Pinterest. How do you create content for others? Because that's something that I I kind of cringe with thinking of handing off Mm -hmm. because you have to find someone who can use your voice in doing it and, you know, get that point across. And it goes back to, I've said this before, like, I'm amazed people trust me to do what I do for them Mm -hmm. because I have such a trust issue (laughs) with allowing others to do something for me in my business. Um, So how, how do you create content for others? Tell me how that process works and what that looks like. How do you do it? So actually, I don't do social media for other people. I offer them the strategy to do it for themselves. And I kind of come alongside and offer that accountability, offer that second set of eyes, go through and finalize to make sure that it's going through what I call the translator piece. So to you know, there are people who do social media management. There are people who offer copy. I don't do either of those. So the process of, of what it looks like for me and my clients is the biggest hurdle that we have to come over is narrowing down exactly who you're talking to. And this is the piece that everyone skips over because it's not as fun and cool as is picking your colors or your fonts or your logo or your website, right? People just jump to that immediately. You're like, oh, I want to start a business. What's the first thing you do? You start a mood board on Pinterest of what you want it to look like. Instead of who are we talking to? Because you're not going to be able to serve them well if you don't know who you're serving. So I like to paint the picture of if you, you know, were throwing an event at your house, let's say that you have like a book club that meets once a week or so, and you 
have to know who's coming to know what kind of food to put out, right? Like if you've got women that are in their 30s or 40s, you're probably not throwing out some frozen pizza rolls, okay? You're just not. We're not serving 17-year-old boys here. You're probably going to throw out some some nice cheese and wine, maybe like a spinach artichoke dip because you know who's coming to the party. You may be like, oh yeah, Shannon's gluten-free. We should probably have some options for her and all these different things. And so when you look at your little corner on the internet, that is your party that you're hosting however many times a week and who's coming to that party and how can you serve them. But I want you to narrow it down to one person. And this is where, you know, we mentioned earlier, people get nervous about niching it down. But when you can talk to one person, it's not as intimidating as trying to please and serve an arena of people, which is what people immediately think when you say, who's your target audience? That sounds like I'm looking out from the stage of a T-Swift concert. That's a lot of people I'm trying to please, right? (laughs) Like, and I'm not Taylor Swift or Beyonce. So I'm not going to please 99.99% of the world. So if I can just focus on the one person who, if I could have all of my clients or all of my customers, customers be made up of just this one person, if they could all be like this one person, who would that be? What are their characteristics? What stage of life are they in? What kind of examples would you give? So for example, if you're someone who wants to build up like an essential oil business, like Young Living or something like that, how you're going to sell to someone who is in their 60s is going to be very different to someone who's in their early 20s. The examples that you bring up, if you're talking about being a new mom, that's not really going to resonate a whole lot with somebody in their 60s. If you're talking about your, having your grandkids have a safe environment to play in and having you know safe options for them, that's not going to resonate with somebody who's in their early 20s. So knowing exactly who you're talking to is the biggest thing that we hit home on. And from there, we partner who you're talking to and what you offer and what your personal brand consists of to narrow it down to say three three to five topics that we're going to filter through to talk to them about on a regular basis. And there's kind of this worry with a lot of people in the beginning of, well, how much is too much personal? How much is too much business? I just want you to think of it as again, you're just having someone over for coffee at your house. You're, if you're having someone over for coffee at your house, you're not only talking about the one thing, you're not right. Like how many of us have been to a book club? Not me, but I'm just going to assume based off movies (laughs) that you do not hardly ever even only talk about the book, right? You're talking about your husbands and your kids and like all the different things of life. And you're probably going to touch on the book as well. So knowing that you are are building this no like trust factor with them by really building a relationship that is where i come into play and say okay now let's take a look at what people are actually telling you or they're telling your competitors and complementaries meaning the people who are also serving the people you want to work with what is their exact language because here's the translator piece that i mentioned earlier that everyone is missing everyone wants to stay in their own like industries lingo. And that's where they're missing the mark every time. It's where it's like, it's going over your dream client's head because you are so stuck in your own industry that you think that they automatically understand that and that that resonates with them. However, if they understood that and it resonated with them, they would not be hiring you. So for instance, you know, I have I've worked with people who are like brand experts and they want to use like all this like super high level branding lingo ultimately because after we've gotten into more discussion, it's because they want to appear as like an authority or they want to appear like they are the go-to person. They are the most educated. They're the most to be relied on. But in actuality, what happens is people say like, I can't resonate with that. And if you make people feel like they can't understand what even at the basic level of what you're saying, they're going to feel intimidated and not want to work with you. Whereas if you explain it in their terms, you automatically build that trust factor and then you are their go-to person. It's why the person you know who speaks at a third grade reading level wins the presidential election because they're making it (laughs) easily accessible for all to understand what they are talking about. So while you may be worried that you're going to diminish your ability to be seen as an authority, you're actually doing the opposite. So I think for me, if you're wanting to build authority, if that's still like a factor for you of this insecurity of I need to build authority, give free trainings on what you're talking about, but do it in their language. And, you know, the next question people usually have is, okay, well, how do I know what their language is? You literally repeat their exact words back to them. So then (laughs) if somebody sends you, you know, a DM and they're saying, it's just so hard for me to pitch to other people because I get weird about pitching, you may never describe it in those words. But now you know 
this is how they word that problem. You may know that that is imposter syndrome, but imposter syndrome doesn't resonate with them because that's not their lingo because maybe they're new to the industry or whatever. So when you're going to create content, you're going to say, look, I get it. You feel weird about pitching yourself. And then literally the exact words that they sent you, because here's what that does is it helps them to feel like, holy smokes, like you get me, like you are in my head, like you're always one step ahead of me when in actuality, you're just continuing the conversation that's already going on in their head. And when you're able to do that, that's like, bam, like magic is going to happen. They're going to immediately trust you because you are saying, hey, I see you and I understand where you're at. And I'm going to break this down in a way that makes sense to you. Does that make sense? Yes, wise one. That's going to be my new (laughs) nickname for you. I'm sitting here and I'm going, oh, wow, this is like such an education, even though I know this already, you know, but Mm -hmm. hearing you say it, I love the way you're breaking it down and it makes total sense. And I I think it's the most worthwhile thing that you can help us with. It's, yeah, you are wise beyond your years. I'm just going to keep repeating that. How did you... you Yeah. How did you figure this out? Because obviously you need, like, I've, I've heard people talk about this, you know, type of subject and and strategy and everything, but I love the way you communicate it and verbalize it. And to me, that's something that can take years for people to understand and be able to, you know, work with and, and create a business on. So how is it that you figured this out? Um, I think because I finally leaned into who I was because I realized if I'm going to build a personal brand, then I should probably be the person that I really am. And so immediately when I started talking the way that I would to my best friend, which is essentially who I would want to work with, I I don't want to work with someone who I wouldn't want to go grab lunch with, right? So when I started speaking to them that way and I started really listening to what people were telling me and then communicating that back to them, I noticed a shift happened because I didn't sound like everyone else. Everyone thinks there's some magic formula to like stand out of the noise and stand out of the crowd. Okay. If you don't want to sound like everyone in the crowd, then stop trying to sound like everyone in the crowd. Stop trying to sound like every other coach out there, every other photographer, every other podcast pitcher out there and just be yourself. And I that is like, everyone's going to roll their eyes and be like, okay, yeah, we all see that on a sign in Hobby Lobby. Be you. Nobody else can be you. But for real, that is like your biggest asset is to just be yourself. The, like I did an um, Instagram post a while back about how everyone in their 20s feels this weird, unspoken pressure to just absolutely be crushing it before you're 30. I'm 25 and I feel that pressure. And so I just spoke from that space that I would if I was like out to dinner with a friend and being like, dude, like, why do we all feel like we need to like have a corner office and 3.5 kids and like making a certain amount of money by 30? What is the whole thing about 30? So then I listed like, I don't know, a handful of really successful people that I highly look up to um, that have crushed it way after 30 and just kind of put things in a perspective. And that hit really home with my community because the the community that I would love to build up is creative millennial female entrepreneurs, which is getting, you can even niche it down further than that. But that in and of itself is a filter, a filter, a filter, a filter down into a certain type of person that I want to serve. And that would hit really home for them. And I think also knowing that your dream client is likely a past version of yourself or a current version of yourself or a future version version of yourself, that is very helpful as well, because you can say, okay, what did Madison two years ago need to hear? What was she going through? What types of things was she struggling with? Because that can help you know what other types of topics to talk about as well that may have to do with what you're offering as business, but may just also be there as a friend as well. So, you know, me, me two years ago, even me now, I sometimes will talk about, you know, body image and self-love because those that's been a journey for me that I'm still on, still working through. Um, and I know it's going to resonate with the person that I want to work with as well. It's so true because as we sat here and I have my ideal, you know, client avatar and I have it all written down. And yet I have even said in an Instagram post, like I'm actually speaking to myself when I'm, you know, preaching to the choir, I'm really preaching to myself of Mm -hmm. this is what we need to do. This is what I need to do. And so my messages aren't just for, you know, Sheila over there. It's really for me. This is 
this is the type of mom I want to be. And this is the type of business I want to have and, and how I want my kids to see me and the type of wife I want to be and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So I, I love that you said that because I literally was sitting here thinking about that of like, I am my ideal client, my ideal listener. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think it all boils down to as well. I've worked with so many different types of people that a lot of people fall into a couple different categories. So when I'm trying to teach this or explain this to them, when we are narrowing down who our dream client is, some people need it to be an avatar, meaning they need it to be kind of this imaginated person that's not a real person in their life, but it's somebody that they can kind of add characteristics to or, or tweak throughout time and, and as they're going about. That's great for people who are very imaginative, people who are big dreamers, all of that. People, there are some people though who are not like that at all. They're just not wired that way. And so I've had to learn to say, okay, who is someone that you have loved working with that's in your real life? Or who's someone that you would want to work with in your real life? And how can we only talk to them? So let's say like it's a girl named Katie, right? Let's say every time you're jumping on Instagram stories, you're only talking to Katie as if you had that. I don't know if you know about that app called Marco Polo, where it's basically like texting, but it's just video messages back and forth. I want you to just envision yeah. that you're only talking to Katie. And some people need it to be like very like something in their real life. Some people are more imaginative and it's harder for them if they choose it to be someone in their real life. And so I think just kind of knowing that about yourself, which works best for you will really help you to move forward with grace. And that's something that I'm learning even right now, because I am personally, if you're familiar with the Enneagram, I don't know if your community is, but I, we just did an episode on it. Um, last week it aired. Oh, awesome. Awesome. On the so Enneagram. <laughs> I am an Enneagram seven and nearly everyone who I've ever looked up to in business is an Enneagram three. And so I have hardcore struggled with, am I just not cut out for this? I don't, I'm not wired the way that they are. When I try to do it their way, I feel defeated. I feel awful. I like, it just doesn't work. Cause that's not how I was designed. Like, and the, the more I started to lean into, okay, what does work for me? and give myself the freedom to figure it out, even if I don't see it yet, even if I don't have anyone to look up to to say, well, they figured it out and they're wired like me, allowing myself the grace and the freedom to be the one to go first, even if I haven't seen the example of it yet, has been huge. I, I love that you brought that up and I'm a three wing four, so. <laughs> yep, of course you are. <laughs> uh, I love my threes though, don't get me wrong. Like I said, most of the people I look up to are threes. A lot of my, actually all of my business friends for the most part are threes and I need threes to rein me back in because I will just shiny object syndrome it all day long. And the threes are like, let's look at some analytics. Let's look at when I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no. Let's all go to happy hour instead. It's fine. <laughs> you can have happy hour and look at analytics at the same time. <laughs> and that's why I need threes in my that's life. That's when it's really like, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you are, you, you're wise beyond your years. I'm just going to keep repeating it because you are such a wealth of information and I love the way you tackle these strategies and the way that you're able to talk to your clients and figure out, you know, how do they think and what will work for them in defining who they want to talk to because it's so important in, especially right now because everything's online. Mm -hmm. So you really have to know who you're talking to, who you want to talk to. And, you know, for some, figuring that out is really easy. But as you said, for some others, you, you need to find a new way to figure out who that person is. And you just, you break it down so beautifully. I, I, I love it. I'm, I'm so impressed, Madison. And I, I have been since I, you came into my life because I wish I was at 25 what you are. <laughs> well, if you ever want to feel really good about yourself, you just go listen to some of my first episodes because lots of grace to her. Lots of... <laughs> <laughs> It's been a learning process. And I think just allowing yourself to, again, just be a beginner and be okay with that and be in training and allow that to be okay. Like put it out there anyways, even though it's not perfect, which I know my Enneagram ones are just, that's just breaking their hearts right now, but I am not a perfectionist by any means. And so I, I honestly do have a hard time resonating with that. But I think that that's been a strong suit for me is I don't overthink it. I just... I just try it. And if it doesn't work, okay, we just pivot. And I think that then, you know, like that friends episode, you just pivot and you pivot. <laughs> you just keep yes. pivoting till you figure it out. And also I think it's important going back to knowing 
what way works best for you and trying that out. It's also important to know what your definition of success is because it can, it, bec- it can easily become a trap of comparison when you're seeing how a lot of people you look up to kind of all have this same standard of success. And you may be thinking, but that's actually not what I want. When I step back, I may want some of what they have, but the whole picture of how they got it, I don't want that. Maybe you do want to be you know, most of the time stay at home mom, but you want to build a business during nap time. And that's really it. Because other than that, you want to be with your babies. And that is perfectly fine. Maybe you want to have an in-person sitter. Maybe you don't have kids at all and you want to go all in and you want to build six figures in two months, whatever it is, it's fine. You just have to know that that's what your version of success is. And that's what you're working towards and stay in your own lane for that. Because it can be really easy to compare, you know, what you what you have to what somebody else has for me personally i have compared like financial goals to some of my friends and then i realized well my financial goals weren't really like my main priority in the past 2 years so it's not fair for me to like pick and choose the best of what people are doing and compare all of it and kind of make this fake person in my head of how I'm supposed to be perfect at all of these things, if that makes sense, right? So I may be crushing it at building a community right now. And my friend is crushing it at building her financial goals, but she's not crushing it in the community element. But I don't focus on that. I only focus on the financial department. And then I have another friend who's really crushing it in the gym. And I'm like, dang, she looks great. Like I want to look great, but she may be like just floundering in every other area of her life. But I'm not looking at that. I'm only looking at like the best thing that she's got going for her and kind of putting all these things that I'm taking from everyone and thinking everyone's crushing it. And you buy that lie and you realize if you were to really focus on that one person and looked at their whole life as a whole, they're not fully crushing it. They're focused on one thing and they're going in on that one thing. And you have to be okay with the one thing that you're choosing to go all in on right now. So true. Love it. Love it. Love it. Madison, can you please share with everyone where they can find you and listen to your podcast? Yeah. So my podcast is The Fearless Chase. Um, On Instagram, I'm at Madison Bailey Anaya and also just started a second Instagram, which I was really hesitant to do, but I am loving it, (laughs) uh, which is at The Fearless Chase Community. And we would love to just see you over on any of those spaces. Yes. And I'm over on all three. So come on over, everybody. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me, Madison. I really enjoyed talking to you, my wise one. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much. This has seriously been the best way to start my day. So thank you. Oh, thanks. Talk about a ball of energy. I adore Madison and really feel like the knowledge she dropped was so very true and helpful. We should be focusing on serving others in our business and not just impressing them with our knowledge. Being focused on being the person who knows it all is not going to help anyone, nor is it going to move the needle in your business. My favorite takeaway from this conversation with Madison was to be yourself and to serve. It's simple, eloquent, and just feels good all around. I hope you were inspired by Madison's message and I would love to see you over in the Fearless Chase community. I'm a part of it and it's truly filled with incredible women who are rocking the world and fearlessly going after their dreams. You deserve to go after yours and fearlessly create your future. So make it happen. Until next week, my friends, stay safe, stay healthy and stay fearlessly happy. (laughs) 